Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to a World Well-Nourished Dairy's Role in Health and Sustainable Food Systems webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. You may also submit a written question using the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press the star followed by the zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded today, Thursday, February 7, 2019. I will now like to turn the conference over to Katie Brown, Senior Vice President, Sustainable Nutrition for the National Dairy Council. Please go ahead, Madam. Thanks, Nelson. Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for logging into our Dairy Nourishes Life webinar series. I'm Katie Brown. I'm a registered dietitian and have a passion for connecting agriculture, food, nutrition, and health to elevate sustainable nutrition as relevant, meaningful, and actionable. I'm part of a team that leads thought leadership and education efforts at National Dairy Council. Each quarter we'll be hosting a webinar addressing a range of health, nutrition, and wellness topics of interest to practitioners like you in an effort to help you navigate questions you may be fielding from clients, patients, or media on hot topics. If you're following this webinar on social media, please use the hashtag Dairy Nourishes Life. We're kicking off today's webinar on how the dairy community is contributing to sustainable food systems. And before we get started, I'd like to remind you that this webinar is approved for one CEU through the Commission on Dietetic Registration, the American College of Sports Medicine, and the National Strength Conditioning <coughs> Association. We've reserved time at the end of the presentation for your questions and discussion. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box window as they come up, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And finally, this webinar will be recorded and available on NDC's website for future reference. And following the webinar, you'll be receiving an email with a survey and link for your certificate of attendance and your CEU. For those of you not familiar with National Dairy Council, NDC is a nonprofit organization founded by America's dairy farmers and funded by the Dairy Checkoff. We represent about 40,000 dairy farm families across the U.S. as well as dairy importers. And you know, the U.S. dairy farmers and the dairy community believe in a world well-nourished, and we're committed to providing responsibly produced nutritious dairy foods that help nourish people, strengthen communities, and foster a sustainable future. And those of us at National Dairy Council, uh, among our staff of diverse team of scientists and registered dietitians and communication professionals, strive to advance the dairy community's shared vision of a he healthy, happy, sustainable world with science as our foundation. You know, the convergence of environmental considerations and dietary guidance has never been more prominent. Nutritiously feeding a growing world population with limited natural resources is at the core of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the Decade of Action on Nutrition. And there's a growing number of research reports and commentary in the scientific literature and within public health dialogue that are directed towards sustainable diets. And many of these focus on the value of plant-based diets, but also minimize the value of animal source foods, including dairy, in healthy and sustainable diets. Now, the United Nations has, uh, the FAO has the globally accepted definition of a sustainable diet, and their definition states that sustainable diets are those with low environmental impacts, which contribute to food and nutrition security and to healthy life for present and future generations. They are protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems, culturally acceptable, accessible, economically fair and affordable, nutritionally adequate, safe and healthy, all while optimizing natural and human resources. But this is a comprehensive list of important factors that illustrates that sustainable diets are multifactorial and they include considerations in social, environmental, and economic aspects of sustainability. And we're seeing the sustainable diets discussion also happening at the local level across the country. The most trusted health and wellness professionals and thought leaders, physicians, dietitians, and even fitness professionals are changing the way they think about food. And this is a reflection of the growing segment of the population who are interested in making food choices that are healthy for themselves and their families with the assurance that their food was grown or raised responsibly and sustainably. So we're at this important fusion of personal health and planetary health. And in today's webinar, we'll be sharing science, innovation, and commitment to continuous progress that illustrates that the dairy 
community and dairy products are a valuable contributor to health and sustainable food systems. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Frank Mettliner, Professor and Air Quality Extension Specialist in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis, and my colleague, Dr. Juan Tricarico, Vice President of Sustainability Research at National Dairy Council. And before I turn it over to Frank, I just wanted to note that ensuring that cows and, uh, are well taken care for, fed a nutritionally balanced diet, and receive ethical treatment are core to what dairy farmers do daily because dairy cows not only provide nourishment for people, but also contribute to livelihoods and vibrant communities. Because of these best practices and efficiencies, a gallon of milk today can, produ can be produced by using 90% less land, 65% less water, and generating 76% less manure, resulting in a 63% smaller carbon footprint compared to about 70 years ago. But this is not the end game. The U.S. dairy community has pledged to continuously improve and has a voluntary goal to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2020. And you know, greenhouse gas is a popular topic these days, but many health professionals aren't well versed in the nuances of environmental sustainability. So I'll turn it over now to Dr. Mittliner to tell us a little bit more and give us some insights into the environmental aspect of sustainable nutrition. Dr. Mittliner? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, this is Frank Mittliner. I'm at UC Davis and uh, I study the impact of animal agriculture on the environment. I was asked to talk to you about the impact dairies have on the environment and particularly um, the impact the dairy sector has on carbon emissions, on greenhouse gases. Uh, certainly not the only environmental issue, but one of the more prominent ones. Without going into great detail with respect to uh, environmental quality, I do um, um, want to really emphasize on the, on the carbon uh, portion of it. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can. There's my handle. Um, in general, when people talk about greenhouse gases, what this is really about is, uh, just in a few moments here, the sun radiating down solar beams to the surface of the Earth. Normally, they would be reflected back into space if there weren't these greenhouse gases. Gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, gases that trap the heat from the sun and retain that heat. Now, these different gases trap the heat uh, at a different rate, and that's referred to as the global warming potential. CO2, uh, on the left side here, you see that molecule, traps the heat, but not very well, and therefore its global warming potential is the lowest. Methane is almost 30 times that uh, of CO2, and nitrous oxide, the third greenhouse gas, almost 300 times more potent than CO2. Um, the most important greenhouse gas in the animal agriculture arena, and that of course includes dairies, is methane. Uh, that's being um, debated hotly. Um, I think one very interesting nuance uh, in the discussion should be the lifespan of these gases, because here's a big difference between the first and the last uh, on the one hand and the second gas on the, on the other. Uh, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide have a very long lifespan. Once they are in the atmosphere, they stay there for a long time. Whereas methane is a so-called short-lived climate pollutant with a lifespan of only 10 years. But um, the nuances there and the discussion I have to leave for future um, webinars. But it will become important and you will soon hear why. When it comes to calculating the environmental footprint of livestock, in this case of dairy, then it's not just uh, quantifying, let's say, enteric emissions from the front end of a cow or the emissions from the manure, but you really want to use what's called an LCA, a life cycle assessment, in which the total emissions are assessed from the entire life cycle of producing, let's say, a gallon of milk, from soil to crops to feed, the herd, the manure, all of that contributes to the carbon footprint, to the water footprint, and so on, of, let's say, a gallon of milk. Um, but it doesn't end when leaving the dairy because the product is shipped on to a creamery or to a distribution center. Eventually, it ends up in some household or restaurant. All of that is part of the life cycle. In fact, everything from cradle to grave, meaning from the soil all the way to you putting that product in your mouth, is part of the life cycle of that product. 
In fact, the dairy sector was probably the first that really took um, the calculation of its impact using life cycle assessment seriously. And uh, they actually have now uh, various results, that, some of which I will share with you. The dairy sector also followed uh, the guidelines that um, we established with uh, under the auspices of the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. I served as chairman there for a couple of years, uh, establishing a global set of guidelines to conduct these life cycle assessments. Uh, so that's basically a global gold standard for assessing the environmental footprint of dairy, of beef, and so on. So again, the dairy sector conducted LCAs and followed these uh, LEAP guidelines. Now, this is what a life cycle assessment uh, would include, anything from the production of feed for the cows on the left, and then I go from the bottom to the top. The milk production on the dairy is part of the life cycle, of course, the milk transport, uh, the processing to the creamery, the packaging of the product, the distribution, the retail, and finally the, the consumer. All of that um, entails uh, the life cycle of, let's say, a gallon of milk. So it's important for us to know what portion of the life cycle is how much and how important of a contributor to greenhouse gases, water, and so on. On this slide here, you see first that uh, the dairy total life cycle impact, uh, greenhouse gas impact assessed using life cycle um, uh, methodologies is 2%. In other words, 2% of all greenhouse gases that we measure in the United States, so 2% of the total is from the dairy sector, just to give you a general idea. And now you see there are three products, a glass of milk, uh, then some cheese and some yogurt. Um, and in color next to it, you see the relative contributors uh, to the carbon footprint of these products. So what you see on the left is that 51% of the carbon footprint of a glass of milk um, is caused by what's happening on the dairy farm. So by housing cows, by uh, dealing with manure and so forth. 19% is caused by the feed that's grown to feed those animals. So we now know what part of the life cycle contributes to how much of the carbon footprint of milk, of cheese, of uh, all the other dairy products. So this is all a result of uh, work that was done by Greg Toma at the University of Arkansas uh, and several of uh, several other colleagues. Uh, it has all been peer-reviewed and published and is uh, readily available. You see one of the sources there uh, listed. Some people are concerned with respect to the water impact of uh, dairy. Um, a total of 5% of U.S. water withdrawal is attributed to the dairy sector. Uh, so if you look at the total 5.1% of all water, blue water that is, uh, used in the United States, uh, so 5.1% is the dairy contribution to water use, you will see on the left that only 0.2% is due to what's actually happening on the dairy farm itself, cows drinking, cows being washed, and so on. On the right side, you see that the vast majority of the water that's used for dairy is really used to irrigate feed. So as you can see, there 4.9 out of the 5.1% is actually used to grow feed. Okay? So that's where the majority of dairy-related water goes to. You might wonder how important is agriculture, or in particular animal agriculture, compared to other sectors of society with respect to greenhouse gases. What you see on this slide is an Environmental Protection Agency inventory slide um, for the entire country. Uh, these numbers are not assessed using life cycle assessments, but this is uh, basically a total inventory looking at how important the different sectors are. As you can see here, uh, power production and use on the left side is about 30% of the total. So 30% of all greenhouse gases emitted in the United States stem from power production and use. 26% from the transportation sector, 21% from industry. And now you see a car depicted, and the number in it is 9 now, that's a little deceiving because the 9% uh, that's listed there is not, is not the contribution of animal agriculture or the dairy sector, but 9% of all greenhouse gases are from all of agriculture. That's animal and plant agriculture combined. 
If you are interested what the total contribution of animal agriculture is alone, that's 3.9% um, uh, according to the Environmental Protection Agency. And I think that number is pretty much uh, right on. I just told you that the dairy sector makes up about 2%, and that is a life cycle assessment number. So it gives you a general idea of how important, how relevant the dairy sector is uh, versus the entire livestock sector and how that compares to sectors such as transportation or power production and use. The reason why I mention this is because in the media you oftentimes hear that livestock produces more greenhouse gases than all transportation, all cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, uh, and that is a false uh, statement that stemmed from an outdated uh, publication from 10 years ago that has since been refuted. If you now think of the entire life cycle of food production, consumption, and beyond, and what has the greatest environmental footprint, then you might think of aspects um, such as transportation or belching or something like that. But indeed, the main contribution of our food supply chain from cradle to grave is the following. This slide here from the National Geographic depicts the most destructive part of our entire food supply chain from A to Z, and that is the food we waste. In the United States, 40%, 40 of all food produced goes to waste. Interestingly, that number 40% does not just hold true for the United States, but globally. So even in, uh, in places like Africa, food waste occurs at a rate of 40%. They're more because can't, uh, people can't harvest on time or can't transport from the fields to the markets or can't preserve or can't refrigerate, whereas here in the United States, for example, food waste occurs more at the consumer levels. I think everybody on the call, no matter how you feel about dairy, about livestock, about food production in general, would agree that this is an unacceptable number. By the way, 40% is the average across all food groups, it is actually higher for perishable foods such as fruits and vegetables, where it's 50%, and on the uh, animal-based foods uh, such as meat and milk, it's 20%. But regardless, uh, these numbers are unacceptably high. I think everybody would agree. Now I'm moving into a topic that I think is a very critical one. When I teach my class here, 300 undergraduate students at UC Davis, it gets them very excited and very motivated to learn more. And that is the so-called 2050 challenge that's depicted on this slide. On the x-axis, you see the year 1750 to 2050, hence the name 2050 challenge. On the, y -ax oh, sorry, on the z axis, you see a number 0 through 10 billions, and that is the number of people in the world. I'm in my late 40s, and when I was a little boy, we were at 3, at three billion people. Today, we have 7.6, and by the time I'm an old man, we will have we will have 9.5 billion people in this, in this world. And that means that throughout our lifetimes, human population on our planet will have tripled. And this is the true 2050 challenge, a tripling of human population throughout our lifetimes. As you can see clearly here, there are two different colors. The one is orange, and that's human population in developed countries, such as the U.S., Europe, and, and so on whereas the other color depicts uh, human population in developing and emerging countries, and there you see that human population is skyrocketing. skyrocketing. And the reason for that is not just people having way more babies or so, but in particular the increasing life expectancy. People in developing countries grow older these days than they did 20, 30 years ago, and that cumulatively has the effect of us having to feed way more people. A good thing, actually, but also a major challenge. So the question we now have is, how do we address that issue, that challenge of feeding a tripled world population? This is one of my favorite slides. It shows a satellite image of the world, all, all of it. And this circle over Southeast Asia depicts a region that contains more people in it than the rest of the world combined. More people live inside than outside the circle, clearly one of the main hotspots for food security in the years to come. This slide here shows also human population increase, and here you can see that Southeast Asia will increase by 41%, Africa by 50%, South America by 7 North America by 4 and, and Europe will slightly shrink. We clearly have hotspots with respect to food security. The question then arises, 
how will we satisfy those nutritional needs of these growing human populations? You see on this slide that the demands for eggs, meat, milk is increasing throughout particularly the developing world, and that's a factor driven by incomes. On the x-axis, you see disposable income of people, and on the y-axis, you see uh, per capita uh, consumption of meat. But you could have the same slide for milk. And what you see here is that more, the more people make, the more disposable income they have, uh, the relatively higher is their uh, demand for animal-based diets uh, and proteins, in this case, meat. This slide is a very important one. It shows the relationship between, uh, on the one hand, milk production per cow per year, and on the other hand, uh, greenhouse gas intensity. What you see uh, toward the left side is um, data points that indicate that there are places, and each data point, by the way, is a country. We have 200 countries in the world. Each data point is a country. You see that on the left side, there are many countries where cows produce very little milk, yet they have a very high carbon footprint. So these are countries, let's say, uh, in Africa or India or you know, developing countries, where a cow might produce no more than 1,000 pounds per cow per year. You might wonder where the United States is. Well, we are not on this slide. We have fallen off to the right because we are producing way more milk than is depicted on that, on that graph. Um, so while many developing countries produce about 1,000 pounds of milk, uh, we produce about 23 to 25,000 pounds of milk here. That means we produce about 20 to 25 times more milk here than they do in many developing countries. And that leads to a situation where we now have hundreds of millions of bovines in a country like India, where indeed if they were to be helped in improving their uh, production, they could, instead of having hundreds of millions of bovines, do the same with 20 or 30 million cows. This slide is from the FAO, and it shows on the x-axis different regions in the world, and on the y-axis greenhouse gas emission intensity. And what you see again is that North America, uh, here all the way to the left, has not the highest, and that's what many people think, but we have the lowest carbon footprint uh, of dairy production. And again, this is North America, not just the U.S. Uh, so if Mexico and the U.S. were teased out, the U.S. Um, relative contribution would be even lower than it is depicted here. So the take-home of that slide is that it is not true that we are um, the least, but we are the most um, carbon-friendly dairy sector of any of the, the developed countries or any of the countries and regions in the world. How have we gotten where we are? Well, there are four main factors. This slide shows on the left improved fertility, improved health, and improved genetics. So reproductive um, efficiency and uh, the veterinary system as well as improved genetics along with the feeding of more energy dense diets. These four factors have allowed us to decrease the number of animals required to produce uh, the amount of food we need to historic levels. We have never had smaller herds and flocks than we have today. This slide here shows this nicely. In 1950 we used to have 25 million dairy cows. Today we have only 9 million dairy cows. So we have way fewer cows, but with these fewer cows, we are producing 60% more milk. So a much smaller herd producing 60% more milk. And that means that the carbon footprint of the same period here, over those 70 years, has shrunk by two-thirds. And the reason why I show you this historic comparison is because I think that the same can be achieved uh, globally today. There's no reason for us to believe that we cannot achieve a drastic improvement in a country like India or in African countries compared to where they are currently by using better techniques and technologies. There's a lot of research going on to further reduce our environmental footprint. Uh, you heard uh, initially um, Cathy uh, saying that the dairy industry has committed to a further decrease in their carbon emissions in their environmental footprint. There's research ongoing in uh, feeding uh, additives and, and, and working on the diet of cows to further reduce, let's say, enteric gases. These are gases that are belched out by cows. There's research going on on reducing the environmental footprint of uh, the waste storage, the so-called lagoons on dairies, and we are very uh, involved in that. The California dairy industry, for example, 
is set to reduce their methane emissions by 40%. Uh, and that's to be achieved within the next 11 years. So pretty drastic commitments there by the dairy sector, not just uh, throughout the United States, but also particularly in regions where the dairy sector is strong. And then um, you can see on a slide like this that the dairy industry is not just talking about this. This is not a bunch of PR, but the dairy industry is actually really working on environmental mitigation and quantification of impacts. What you see on this slide here is something I was involved in a few years back when I personally trained about 1,000 dairymen on where on their dairy they have environmental impacts, how these environmental impacts could be further reduced, and how they can make sure that they comply, uh, comply with all current regulations, rules, and best management practices. So I have to say that uh, even though I'm not uh, you know, employed by the dairy industry or part of the dairy industry, uh, I'm a scientist at a, at a land-grant university, but working with that industry has allowed me to see uh, some, you know, I can, I can see behind the curtain, so to say, and I have to say that I have been quite impressed. Um, the performance is good. It is a leading performance environmentally, uh, globally, and the commitment for further progress is there. So with that, I come to the uh, conclusion of my talk, and uh, I will look forward uh, to entertaining any questions toward the end of, uh, of the joint session. Thank you very much, Frank. My name is Juan Tricarico. I am a Vice President of Sustainability at the National Dairy Council, and I will be uh, presenting the Good for the Animals portion of this seminar. And we will start um, with, a, with a slide that actually addresses some of the, maybe some of you are thinking, you know, some of the, some of the elements or statements that Frank has already shared with you about the environmental performance of the industry in the United States. And so let me begin by saying that innovation uh, is the historical driver of U.S. productivity and reduced environmental impact. These two things go hand in hand. Um, milk production has increased in the United States consistently since 1961. You can see that in the graph. And there are, and, and there are two main components. Some of you uh, on the line may actually be wondering how is it that a, a cow today can produce so much more milk than a cow 50 or 60 years ago. And the reasons are uh, a number of the elements that uh, Frank rela related earlier, those four big aspects of improvement. Uh, one that has been important has been improved breeding. And you see that in red in the slide, providing quite a substantial amount of, of, uh, of improvement. Cows that are naturally inclined to produce milk, farmers are able to identify those cows and keep those cows and breed those cows so that their daughters are also more naturally inclined to produce more milk. And then the management and technology portion, that's the green portion, is everything that relates to the housing, how the animals themselves are managed, and of course, how the animals are fed, which is a topic I will discuss in quite a bit of detail in this presentation. So, as dairy farmers here in the United States have improved food production through milk production, they have done so while using less natural resources and thus protecting the environment. As I said, taking care of cows is a very important component of um, producing milk. And in the case of the United States, dairy farmers demonstrate this commitment to raising and caring for these animals in a humane and ethical manner through their voluntary participation. This is voluntary in the National Dairy Farms Assuring Responsible Management Animal Care Program. That's a mouthful. We call it the farm <laughs> animal care program. And in fact, 98% of, and, and, and even more than 98% now, of U.S. dairy milk uh, comes from farms participating in, the, in this program. The program actually has three different components. The animal care component, which is third-party verif verified, so that ensures that the program's integrity uh, is met by measuring its standards with outside experts. Uh, it also provides uh, verification uh, on the industry's animal care uh, standards. But it also has other components like antibiotic stewardship and environmental stewardship that provide farmers with guidance on how 
um, to use antibiotics when necessary, and what their contribution to uh, some of these environmental impacts are. What I do want to say before we move from this slide is that uh, the Farm Animal Care Program is the first livestock animal care program in the entire world to be recognized by the International Organization for Standardization, that's the ISO, uh, as an animal welfare management standard. And this is extremely important and the industry is really proud to, to have achieved that level of uh, high standard of, of verification. Now, what this program does is that it offers a, a process for continuous improvement so that we can ensure a high level of on-farm animal care, uh, but also uh, an opportunity for farmers to continually improve as time goes by. So in the next slide, what we see is, um, is, a, is a graph or a diagram that we use quite a lot at NDC to talk about how the dairy industry um, actually honors the harvest. And that, when, when we talk about honoring the harvest, we are referring to using food with good purpose so that it's never wasted. That means ensuring that all people have access to nutrient-rich foods, but also utilizing parts of food that people can't or won't eat uh, by moving nutrients through a system, through a food system. So from people to animals, from the animals back to the land to grow more crops that can be converted into food rather than going to the landfill. And we hear sometimes that cows and humans compete for food and other resources. And on the contrary, as we go through this presentation, I will show you how dairy cows are an important contributor to sustainable food systems. So I am going to uh, talk about more, uh, I'm gonna talk more about how cows um, receive a balanced diet. Just to clarify once again, the nutrients move through the system and some of the, some of the elements that uh, the public and many people that don't, uh, that don't necessarily are familiar with how dairy farms are, are run, think about dairy cow manure as a waste. In fact, dairy cow manure is a great fertilizer and, it can, and, the, and the nutrients in that, in that manure are actually very valuable for crops. So they can help restore lost nutrients in the soil and support the growth of new crops. And, and in that way, um, we can, as I say uh, in this slide, honor the harvest. So let's move ahead to the next slide then. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about, you know, more about how cows uh, are fed. Because feeding dairy cows is a very important aspect of taking care for dairy cows. So we ensure the cows are well taken care of. Uh, we are ensured that cows are fed a nutritionally balanced diet and that they receive ethical treatment while doing so. This is core to what farmers do on a daily basis. Because uh, dairy cows, as was already said before, they don't only provide nourishment for people through milk and dairy products, but also contribute to the livelihoods and vibrant communities, particularly in rural areas within the country. So one of the funny things that um, I have um, seen in my experience is that in many cases, um, a lot of people think that a dairy farmer uh, gets on his pickup truck or her pickup truck, drives down the road to a feed store, and then picks up a few bags of feed to provide to their, to their cows. And this is, this is far from the truth, because cows have a specific nutrient needs depending on the stage of their life that they're in. And therefore, dairy farmers team up with animal nutritionists, in this case, dairy cow nutritionists, that make sure that the cows get the wholesome, quality-controlled, and balanced diet that they need for good health. And I'll tell you in the next slide here um, how customized cow nutrition works and what actually happens. Cow, di cow diets are customized, and the exercise begins with an understanding of the available forage sources. These forages for example, you have three pictures there, corn silage, alfalfa hay, and alfalfa silage are the base of all dairy cattle diets. And they're in fact the most variable feed ingredients in terms of their composition and digestibility. These forages are produced at the dairy farm and many times 
they're produced locally, not necessarily by the dairy farmer, but by a neighbor who may be growing those crops and, and selling them to the, to the dairy farmer to feed their cattle. And uh, these forages, as I said, are analyzed for nutritional composition because they're variable, and they're the base of the diet because dairy cows require quite a substantial amount of fiber. They require more fiber than humans in order for their gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal tracts to function properly. Forage, the word forage or roughage is just a, a, a descriptor of whole plants that includes leaves and stems. These are feed materials that contain a very high amount of fiber. Dairy cows can digest these materials because they have microbes, a microbial flora in their four stomachs, and you know, they have a different system than we do. And these micro microbes, these microbial flora, are capable of digesting the fiber. So that's why they can take this fiber and then convert it into milk. Then the, the nutritionist, the dairy cow nutritionist, adds, uses a formulation software and adds other types of feed ingredients. We use the very cryptic term concentrates. Well, concentrates is actually a very simple term. It's a concentrated source of. So it could be a concentrated source of energy, for example, in the case of uh, corn kernel, you know, corn grain, when we, when we feed the cows only the, the, the grain. Uh, and when we do this to provide a balance. In other cases, it could be soybean meal, which is the soy beans are harvested, they're used for oil, so the oil is extracted, and what's left over contains a lot of protein, a high concentration of protein, which is very nutritionally good for the animals, and so we provide that as a concentrate to supply the protein that the cow is, wouldn't get or is not getting from just the forages alone. All of this exercise is, to, is, used, is, is done using software. Uh, and the diet is balanced so that underfeeding or overfeeding of nutrients doesn't happen. Um, this is a very important, as I said. And so now, if we look at the next slide, we see that, in fact, uh, on the national average, dairy cows consume primarily uh, homegrown forages, followed by a large quantity of byproduct feeds. So these are crops that have already been used for something else, like, a human, like to produce a human food product, but some left over, like the example of soybean meal I gave, is used to feed to the animal. Then some whole grains, like the corn, wheat, or barley. And finally, some feed supplements that are specific sources of vitamins or specific fats that they may need or minerals that the cows may need. The important point that I want to point out in this particular slide is that the, that the animals are eating parts of crops that humans can't eat. We cannot eat them because we cannot digest them. And this reduces the need for crops to be grown uh, to feed the cows because these crops are serving dual purposes. So in the next slide that I want to show you, um, I, I basically want to show you that cows and people are not competing for food with this, with this information and that, in fact, dairy feed is not primarily composed of human edible cereal grains and oil seeds. 20% um, of what cows eat could be eaten by people. Uh, that's what you see on the left-hand side of this slide. But in reality, only 2% of what cows eat is eaten by people based on food industry demand. Because even though um, we could eat, for example, corn grain, just a kernel, uh, we don't choose to eat that much corn. We actually, as humans, choose to eat, for example, a lot more wheat than corn. We have a preference for that. So with, uh, with that, I would like to go to the next slide, which talks about a study that was published um, in 2017, in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science, it was a modeling study uh, that compared the nutritional adequacy and greenhouse gas emissions from least cost diets with and without animals. 
And what this study did is they found uh, there's a number of interesting findings. First of all is that, is that if all food animals were removed from U.S. agriculture, we would have an increase, a 23% increase in total U.S. food supply. But this increase would mostly be from crops that Midwestern states can grow very well, and that is corn and soybeans, not crops that we as humans eat a lot of. We would need to eat more food as human beings to, to meet our nutrient requirements because these uh, foods are lower uh, in essential nutrient density. Uh, Plant-based foods have lower nutrient density in, in some of the key nutrients. Uh, and in doing so, because we would need to eat more food to meet our nutrient demands, we would also be consuming a greater amount of excess calories, uh, making uh, an, the obesity problem even worse. Some of the deficiencies that we currently have would still be there, but some of the deficiencies uh, that we're trying really hard not to have as a population would actually get worse. And you can see some of those there on the slide, things like calcium, vitamins A uh, and B12, and some very important essential fatty acids. Uh, that means that a plant-only diet would be unable to support the nutritional needs of the U.S human population without nutrient supplements. So we would have to be popping quite a lot of pills. And all of these would come at um, of an environmental price tag of a, of a reduction of only 2.6% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, which basically is within the margin of error for all emissions. So with that, I'd like to finish my presentation with this summary slide that basically says that Dairy cows are primarily, you know, what they eat uh, are primarily made up of foods that people can't eat. We, we actually call them feed, not food. Uh, the dairy cows are, are turning plants and, and a lot of byproducts into high-quality nutrients in the form of milk, nutrients like protein, calcium, uh, and some of the vitamins, and that these milk and dairy products do nourish people, uh, and that these animals are able to do that because they have that four-chamber stomach and they have a different digestive process that allows them to take advantage of foods we can't. And in doing so, dairy cows do actually make a net positive contribution to the food supply in the United States. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and pass on the baton over to Katie. Great. Thanks, Juan. Wow, a lot of good content uh, in the webinar so far. And for those of you on the phone and on the webinar, you're probably aware that a large body of evidence links dairy consumption with improved bone health, particularly among children. But you may not know that there's also a strong body of evidence indicating that dairy consumption is associated with reducing risk of some of the most prevalent chronic diseases in the U.S. and around the world, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and high blood pressure. So let's take a quick look at dairy's unique nutrient profile and how it contributes to health across the lifespan. And we'll just start with the basics. You know, milk contains a powerful nutrient package of nine essential nutrients, with each nutrient offering a specific benefit to our health and to, to our bodies. In fact, milk is the number one food source of three of the four under-consumed nutrients of public health concern identified by the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, uh, calcium, vitamin D, and potassium. And in addition to the nutrient-rich milk, which is the primary ingredient, it's also... Um, it also contributes seven essential nutrients to uh, every serving of yogurt and six essential nutrients to every serving of cheese. And while we think about um, and hear about most people not consuming enough servings of fruits and vegetables, which is true, we also want to recognize that nearly nine out of ten people in America fall short on the dietary guidelines recommendations for dairy. You can see in the red box, Americans consume an, on average about uh, just under two cup equivalents of dairy servings per day. So just adding one more serving of dairy a day would help people meet the recommendations, close those shortfall nutrient gaps, and support health benefits. Now occasionally we hear that people will say it's easy to replace calcium in milk with other foods like leafy greens, but the reality is you'd have to eat 36 and a half cups of raw kale, for example, to get the equivalent amount. And this is not just about calcium, it's about the total nutrient package. The fact of the matter is that the nutrient density profile of dairy foods makes it really hard to replace. Um, trying to obtain the same nutrients in milk and dairy products through alternative sources could mean 
consuming excess calories from those sources, um, and those sources may have less bioavailability. So let's not forget the affordability of milk and dairy products as well. You know, it costs about a dollar a day to get three servings of dairy as recommended as, uh, as a recommended part of the healthy U.S. eating pattern. Now, if you're looking for resources to help people better understand the nutritional trade-off, these flashcards found on nationaldairycouncil.org provide at-a-glance nutritional and ingredient information on cow's milk and various dairy alternatives like soy, rice, almond, coconut, and cashew beverages. And because of their unique nutrient profile, you know, the last three editions of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines have recommended three servings of dairy foods such as milk, cheese, and yogurt for those age nine and over, um, two servings a day for those two to three years old, and two and a half servings for those four to eight years old. And it, in addition to the nutrient value, uh, the past two dietary guidelines advisory committees have reviewed the evidence on dairy consumption and risk for some of the most prevalent chronic diseases in the U.S. And the 2010 DGAC report concluded that moderate evidence indicates that intake of milk and milk products is associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes and with lower blood pressure in adults. And this evidence was even stronger in the 2015 report that stated that consumption of dairy foods provides numerous health benefits, including lower risk of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. Now, in essence of time, I just wanted to point out that there are a large and growing body of evidence at least 55 high-quality studies in the past six-plus years that have shown that consumption of dairy foods, regardless of fat content, is either neutral or beneficial in reducing risk for several of these chronic diseases, again, the, some of the most prevalent chronic diseases um, in the country and around the world. Now, we've been hearing a lot about plant-based diets uh, lately. Um, but what we should remember is that plant-based doesn't and shouldn't mean plant-only. The U.S. Uh, healthy U.S. healthy ve vegetarian and healthy Mediterranean-style patterns in the 2015 dietary guidelines all include plant and animal foods, as the DGA recognizes the unique nutrient contributions of each of the food groups. Um, interestingly, the Mediterranean-style pattern is lower in calcium and vitamin D, two of the nutrients of public health concern many Americans are under-consuming because it includes only two servings a day of dairy foods versus the three servings of dairy in the healthy U.S. and the healthy vegetarian patterns. In fact, it provides about 700 to 800 milligrams of calcium and therefore falls 200 to 600 milligrams below what's recommended in the U.S. depending on age and gender. And dairy is also included in the DASH diet, the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension Eating Plan, um, as well as eating patterns recommended by the American Heart Association and guidelines from the National Osteoporosis Foundation. Um, and uh, according to this modeling study, uh, there was a, a mix of plant foods and dairy foods that, that has actually the best chance of closing the nutrient gaps in common diet consumption patterns of Americans from the NHANES database. So this is a modeling study that looked at the nutritional impact of um, different dietary scenarios by doubling the intake of plant-based foods or dairy foods. And when the plant foods were increased by 100%, again, this is what people commonly eat based on um, NHANES data, people were more likely to, to meet their nutrient requirements for magnesium, iron, folate, vitamins C and E, which was great, but they were less likely to meet their nutrient targets for calcium, protein, vitamin A, and vitamin D. But when increasing dairy foods to align with the recommended amount, uh, it helped more people reach their nutrient goals for calcium, protein, magnesium, vitamins A and D, while sodium and saturated fat levels increased as well. So this study illustrates that it's not plant versus animal foods, but plant plus animal foods to help close the nutrient gaps that exist among Americans over age two. And as we wrap up, I hope that you have a better understanding of the intersection of personal and planetary health, and the important role that dairy farming and dairy foods play in sustainable nutrition. It's an important conversation and one that all health and wellness professionals probably are and should be engaging in. Uh, National Dairy Council will host quarterly webinars on how dairy plays a role in sustainable nutrition, and we hope you join us for those and engage in this important conversation. And for more evidence-based 
materials to ensure you have the latest on dairy's role in health and sustainable food systems, please please uh, log on to and visit nationaldairycouncil.org. And before we um, take it to uh, our questions and discussion period, I'd like to remind you that this webinar will be archived on nationaldairycouncil.org. And in addition, I invite you to join the Dairy Nourishes Network. Um, this is for health and wellness professionals who join the network and will uh, receive quarterly updates on dairy research and news, advanced notice on webinars, recipe ideas and meal tips, opportunities to participate in engaging contests, as well as um, being highlighted on NDC social media and invitations to in-person educational and networking events. So excited about launching the Dairy Nourishes Network and hope you'll join. Your post-webinar email will have a link to join the network and you can also register at nationaldairycouncil.org. So now we'll turn it over to uh, some questions that have come in. And really, thank you so much for the engaging questions that, that you've been posting um, in the chat box. So the first question will be directed towards uh, – I guess I'll take this first question and, and ask about dairy and um, being local and why is uh, why does dairy um, sold in from such faraway places um, when it could be kept more local and and really the answer to that one is that milk is real natural and local um, it's produced in every state in the U.S. and travels less than 350 miles and 48 hours from farm to store so you know you can't get much more local than um, milk and uh, dairy production. Here's a question for Dr. Mittliner. There's a question about grass-fed. Is grass-fed dairy more environmentally friendly when the dairy farms are located in a grassy, hilly region like upstate New York? Um, I don't think that you can generalize it that way. Um, you can have an environmentally sound dairy whether you are on grass, whether you have a pasture dairy, or whether you have a um, a regular freestall dairy. Um, the question is not so much are the animals on grass, uh, but how do you manage both animals? How do you manage their manure? How do you apply that manure as fertilizer to crops and when? Um, I think these are the most important issues. Um, people look at, uh, at, at the grazing situation as this uh, romanticized, uh, or have that r romanticized uh, image, but um, that's not really what tells us whether the environmental footprint is high or low. Um, so it would be way too short to say um, animals on pasture are better for the environment. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Tricarco, do you have anything to add to that question about grass-fed um, grass cows? Agree. There's a... Yeah. I agree 100% with what Frank said. Um, we know that it is all about the management and that there's many different ways to produce milk um, and that uh, farmers uh, are stewards of the land, so they use the resources that they have available. And for those that have the ability to use pasture, um, they can go ahead and use it to produce milk, but others have the ability to uh, grow other crops and house the animals inside uh, to keep them from the elements uh, in some latitudes that's very important because you can get really cold and and that's the best care that the so they always strive for the best care that the animal needs to to have so it's not about a simple answer or of, of uh, pasture based or um, conventionally fed cattle so that addresses the environmental impact side of grass-fed, but um, let's talk for a second about the difference between conventional uh, fed and grass-fed cows from a nutritional point of view and the uh, impact on cow's health. Um, Juan, do you want to start with that? Yeah, so... Um the, so what we what we know in terms of, of uh, nutritional composition is that there, there's no difference. Um, in all of those major nutrients that uh, humans um, can get from from milk that are readily available in milk, uh, and making milk a nutrient dense food and, and dairy products nutrient dense foods, uh, they are the same in both types of uh, in both with both types of production systems. Okay, great. 
So when we think about um, the, the diet of cows and cows that are pasture only versus cows that are fed a mixed ration, do you want to address that? I'm, I'm sorry, exactly what do you want me to address, Katie? Well, I think, I think some of the questions are asking about um, the plant only, the pasture only, grass fed only versus the, the uh, mixed ration diet. And what we heard a little bit from Dr. Mittlener and yourself was, you know, part of the um, cows consuming parts of plants that, that humans don't eat, but also the additional uh, value of a mixed ration diet on uh, cow health and fertility and improved milk production, et cetera. So, right. Okay. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. So, first of all, we are able to produce so much milk from less cows because we feed balanced rations that are more nutrient-dense to cows. Cow, uh, by just allowing cows to graze, directly graze on pasture, they, are, they can't do that. They, the cows cannot produce that high level of milk. The, the, them going out themselves and physically grazing makes them waste a lot of energy. It requires more energy by the animal. But the plants themselves, the grass that they consume, is less nutritionally dense. So by providing a more nutrient-dense diet, those animals can express their natural tendency to produce more milk, their natural inclination. Also, as I said before, in terms of the, of the nutrient composition, the milk is the same. Um, even if some people claim that uh, milk from pastured or grazing animals contain higher quantities of omega-3 fatty acids, those quantities are still low quantities compared to other types of foods. So if you're looking for a source of an omega-3 fatty acid, it's better for somebody to just eat fish than try to get it from milk. That's not one of the strong suits of milk. Milk, it provides calcium, milk provides protein, milk provides some other essential fatty acids, but not omega-3s. So I hope I answered most of the questions that came through on that topic. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's, a, there's a question about the farm program, and there's a few additional questions about uh, animal welfare. Um, one of the questions is, how does farm, the farm program, ensure that animals are treated ethically? Do they conduct inspections? Yes, that's a, gr yes, that's a great question. So, uh, absolutely, the, the farm program is, is run by, by people that visit the farm, and they and they con conduct inspections. <laughs> they they look at a, a variety of uh, of aspects uh, in the farm. They look at the animals themselves. They take you know representative samples uh, of the of the animals. It all depends on the number of animals that are housed and the type of housing. They have all sorts of rules. Every single one of these individuals that goes out there is a, is a certified uh, individual. They have to go through a, certif uh, a certification process before they can actually uh, go to the farm, do the visit, complete the visit. These visits usually take a minimum of two hours where, as I said, uh, the, the, the individual that's auditing the farm goes through the process uh, and, and it goes in a very specific order looking at the, at the young stock like the, the, the baby calves and, and then the heifers if they're any housed in the, in the farm, which is the word that farmers use to refer to young uh, dairy animals, and then eventually the lactating cows, the cows that are producing the milk. They looked at the health of the animals. They look at the conditions in which they live on. They, they look at the rations. They look at what their animals are fed. They, it's a very comprehensive approach. And as I said early, uh, late, uh, earlier in the presentation, those, uh, those uh, um, visits, they're all documented, and eventually uh, a large portion of them are verified through a third-party verification process that uh, provides another extra level of assurance uh, that uh, that the verification is, is, is in place. Okay, super. Thanks, Juan. Um, I want to give a shout out to um, one of the questions that came through from a, a, a student in England, so really happy to have you join us, a dietetic student who's asking about, do you think the public are becoming increasingly confused with veganism and living sustainably? If so, how can this be com combated in practice? 
Um, it's a great question. So thank you for that. And, and you know, I think um, the, the dairy community is aligned with the goal to achieve healthy diets from sustainable food systems. Absolutely, we are, we are interested in that, as, as many are. But when we think about, um, you know, agriculture provides food to nourish the population and contributes livelihoods for billions of people around the world, and it's a resource for sustainable development. And, and we have to consider the health, social, and economic and environmental outcomes um, as relevant to achieving food security, health, and sustainability. Now, remember that um, plants provide significant nutritional contribution to the diet, but so does animal source foods and, you know, all food production. Both plants and animals require input, so they all have an environmental footprint. And what we have to do is consider those, the trade-offs and what we get out of that. And so it, it really is that beautiful mix of plants and animals and animals like dairy cows who contribute many benefits to the environment, which I, ho I hope you know, came through clearly today, that, that nutrient cycling and taking those low nutrient dense plant foods and upcycling them into higher value nutrient dense foods, um, higher quality uh, nut nutrient dense uh, calcium and protein and all of those vitamins and minerals that um, come naturally from milk and milk production. So that upcycling is really important, as well as um, the, the, some of those other products like manure. We can use manure as a natural fertilizer, avoiding the need for synthetic and fossil fuel-based fertilizer. And technology, as, um, as Frank talked about, using methane digesters that can convert manure and food waste into electricity to power communities and create clean biofuels. So there's a lot of um, benefits of that beautiful connection of animals and plants together um, in how we can achieve healthy and sustainable food systems. So I think we are at uh, a little over time. So thank you for your thoughtful questions. Thank you to our participants who logged in from all over the country and, and potentially in other countries, um, as well as our contributors, Dr. Mitliner and uh, Dr. Tricarico. Um, and I'll turn it back over to our operator to close out. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That does conclude the conference call. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please connect your line.